Hello and welcome to The Green Room by Deloitte. This is the podcast where we ask the tricky questions about the world around us. I'm George Parrott and you're listening to episode four, where we ask, can one small change save the planet? Thanks a lot for downloading this week's episode of The Green Room by Deloitte. And as ever, I'm joined by a co-host, and this week I'm joined by Ethan Worth. How's it going, Ethan? Hi, George. Yeah, it's good. Um, as you know, we've been tasked to do our Plastic Free Week challenge, so uh, fresh off the back of that. How did you find it? Yeah, I found it a little tricky sometimes. I, I had my reusable water bottle and I had my uh, reusable coffee cup, so that, that bit was fine, and I haven't, been, haven't bought any... Uh, plastic cups of coffee uh, for the last week or so, which is great. Um, but sometimes, it, you know, when you're buying a meal deal at lunch, then it's almost impossible not to have a plastic bottle with that. So I love a meal deal. There's no sustainable meal deal I found this week. I think that is, <laughs> I that, there's a gap it. in the market for that, definitely. definitely. So, um, how about you? How did you find it? Um, OK, I did fail after two hours because I think I'm addicted to coffee and I uh, forgot my keep cup on day one. Oh, no, no. And I went to the, the coffee shop and said, can I have it without the lid? Because I'm uh, trying to save the planet. Mm. Um, but then apparently health and safety says you have to have the plastic lid. So that was my one failure of the week. Uh, but then I got much better from then. <clears throat> I, I did actually think that, you know, going for food which which needed uh, chopsticks would be better than you know food which needed a plastic fork so i went for the sort of sushi options and and things like that but actually they all came in plastic containers as well so it was a it it's was, a minefield yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's a tough one i have to say yeah. <laughs> so ethan clearly we found this uh, a, a quite a challenge this week and it's a big problem but uh, who have we got in studio with us to talk about it today we're joined with nick robinson nick is our resident sustainability expert He's part of the team who helped to manage and improve our environmental performance. Hi, Nick. Hi, everybody. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. How's it going? And we're joined by Thomas Pell. A former scientist, Tom was inspired to do his lit to save the planet. He and his partner, Jeanette, co-founded the Clean Kilo, the UK's largest zero waste supermarket in Birmingham. Hi, Tom. Hello. OK, great. And uh, I think we'll dive straight into our icebreaker. I'll see what we have. Uh, Get in the bucket. Yeah. See what we have this week in our bucket. Looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. If you could pick up a new skill in an instant, what would it be? That's, uh, I'd, I'd love to be sort of uh, fully fluent in Spanish or, or probably a more, uh, other useful languages. I think that would be good. Instant, instant fluency would be, would be brilliant. Yeah, that's a good one. I, w I wish I could speak more languages. I think from a purely uh, selfish point of view, I'd like to be able to program just because oh, yeah. then I wouldn't become useless in the <laughs> in the economy of the future. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, good, yeah, get, get, get on that coding. Uh, yeah, exactly. Coding lessons, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree about um, learning a language. I'd like to learn Mandarin, but, mm. um, but also I'd, I'd always like to be able to wolf whistle, and I'd like to learn how to do that. <laughs> I'd like to be able to do that pretty quick. So, yeah, quite always cool. useful. Yeah. yeah, you never know. <laughs> Call a taxi. How about you, Ethan? Yeah, I was thinking coding, but I think maybe learn to be able to sing. I'm a terrible singer, and I'd, I'd love to be like, suddenly wow everyone who's always uh, doubted me. Oh, just, just keep practicing in the shower and then, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure one day that may be true. That really can become true, Ethan, that's great. Um, well, brilliant, well, let's, let's sort of dive into it and try and answer this week's question, which is, can one small change save the planet? And I think, uh, just first things first, Tom, it might be useful if you could give a bit of a background about the, the Clean Kilo, how that came about, what the sort of rationale was for that. Sure, so um, as you quite rightly said, it's the the largest zero waste supermarket in, in the UK and it's in fairly central Birmingham in Digbeth. Um, it's, it came about purely from the two of us, myself and Jeanette, um, coming together. Um, we both had an upbringing of, of um, not wasting stuff and for me particularly it was drilled into me to not drop rubbish on the floor and um, through university, I, I, I did chemistry at university and I learned about the environment quite a lot, about environmental chemistry. Um, and um, Jeanette, she was brought up never to waste anything, never to throw anything away, it was always fixed or food was never thrown away, that kind of thing. And I guess the two of us together, um, we watched documentaries, we, we watched uh, one called A Plastic Ocean, which mm -hmm. was on Netflix. Yeah. Jeanette asked this question, like, why is there not a supermarket that exists without any packaging? And she had this image in her mind of, you know, the sort of cereal dispensers you have at hotels where you just like turn the, mm. turn the knob and it, it, it comes out. She imagined that for 
pretty much every product you could imagine in, in the supermarket. And it just so happened that I'd seen something similar in Australia, apart from it was big buckets and, and scooping. And I think these sorts of things existed earlier on as well. Um, but for a different reason, I think that was more called like scoop and save. Mm. And um, so, yeah, we, we set out together um, to start up this um, zero packaging shop um, where customers can bring their own containers, fill them up with anything. Um, the idea is to weigh, fill, reweigh, and then pay. Mm. Um, so you don't pay for the weight of the container, you can bring anything you want um, to fill, and that's that's basically the, the premise of it. So, so I'd, I'd come in with you know some Tupperware or, or exactly. some multi-use plastic and then you know f fill up fill up that for my cereal for the for the week ahead that sort of thing yeah, yeah of course um, people you know bring anything strange things you know I think one person uses a ketchup bottle for um, shampoo on the, in, <laughs> in the shower so you know anything you, you don't like that mixed up do you That's you don't want to get yeah. the two mixed up it'd be a bit of smelly but yeah um, but yeah you can use absolutely anything you like you can buy new stuff that is nice jars or whatever, or you can just use old margarine tubs or whatever you like. And, 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 and generally uh, people are sort of buying into this? Sort Absolutely, of, yeah, 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 nice yeah and busy. definitely. Yeah, very busy and Saturday, it's like a plague of locusts coming in and just <laughs> completely empty the whole sh shop. And um, so yeah, it's, it's really good. Fantastic, that's great. Well, I think we'll, we'll for sure we'll pick, uh, pick some more of your brain later, sure. uh, Tom. But, but Nick, could you just maybe talk about your role and, uh, and, and kind of what, what your background is in, in the wider sort of sustainability discussion? My, my background is, has always been in environmental management pretty much. I, I studied it at university. Um, and then I worked in, uh, in sustainable construction for a while. I've also worked in government at the Ministry of Justice uh, in the sustainable development team there. So I've got a bit of a background in sustainable development policy. My, my role is to look at all aspects of uh, Deloitte's operations and work out how we, can, uh, how we can do things in a greener way, basically. So whether that's reducing energy, reducing waste, uh, reducing our business travel, procuring things more sustainably, mm. um, you name it. It's, uh, it's a, a very <laughs> wide scope. Of, uh, of role, I guess. Before we dive into this, I've heard a lot about the dangers of plastic in the last year or so. Could you please explain to our listeners why, why that's come to the forefront of the discussion? Um, well, plastic itself, I mean, I've heard facts that plastic will, will take up to a thousand years to decompose, and those kinds of facts really scare me because plastic's only been around for 50 years, so I don't know how we can know that entirely, that it's going to be a thousand years, but I expect it will probably be more than that and, and even then when it does degrade it doesn't disappear it breaks down into lots of little tiny pieces which would make the oceans into a, a, a soup basically a soup of plastic and clearing that up is maybe achievable um, who really knows but um, but yeah basically because plastic is so lightweight it, it escapes into the environment you know um, overconsumption means you've got overfilled bins outside everybody's houses and on a windy day and if you put food in your bin you're going to attract birds, bags get split open. On a windy day, a rainy day, that plastic just goes everywhere. It happens in our road um, and it's it so easily happens. It doesn't have to be just something that's dropped on the floor um, and it doesn't matter if you say, you know, I, I recycle everything. That's it's It's great but with plastic apparently can only be recycled three or four times, three to four times on average. So a plastic milk bottle goes through the system. It can be back on the shelf, apparently, within a few days, which is quite impressive. But after it's been through three to four times, it loses its integrity, the plastic does, and it's, it then ends up going to landfill. And so that's part of the reason, both of those reasons are why only 9% of our plastic gets recycled in the whole world. Yeah, I mean, to add to that, I've got some more scary st statistics for you. So um, there's been more plastic produced in the last 10 years than in the whole 20th century. Um, and they have estimated that by 2050, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the oceans if we carry on at, at current rates. So that just illustrates the scale of the problem. And the sources of plastic are, uh, are many and varied. As we know, we use them for everything in everyday life. And as Tom said, a lot of that escapes into the environment. Um, big sources of plastic in terms of countries in the world uh, include Indonesia. It's got a huge population and a lot of coastline and China. Um, now, we in the West might feel complacent about that, but um, the plastic uh, that 
escapes into the oceans from China, a lot of that has been shipped out from the West to China for recycling. Um, and what they do is they pick out the valuable plastic from that recycling and then they tend to throw the rest away and a lot of that will escape into the environment, into the rivers and into the seas. So it's not just a developing world problem and we should definitely think of it as, as our own problem as well. Um, Another reason why, uh, why, why plastic is an issue, uh, Tom touched on it, is, is recycling. China stopped accepting our plastic waste in early 2018, so uh, we are now not able to ship off all our plastic recycling away from, from Britain, and we don't have the facilities in Britain to deal with our plastic waste at the moment, so most of it is simply landfilled or incinerated. So we're not even making the most of, of plastic as a resource. So you can see the scale of the problem just for, from those few Slightly yeah. scary facts. Fairly sobering. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I suppose, I think, yeah, as Ethan and I did this plastic free week uh, in, in, the, in the lead up to this podcast, and uh, it, it coincided with me moving house, which is a little bit tricky. And, uh, you know, I, I think before I was thinking, oh no, we're going to have to use loads of bubble wrap just for, you know, uh, protecting all my, my wife's vases and things like that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, fortunately, actually, uh, we, we used uh, a removal company and they, uh, it was all sort of tissue. Um, sort of paper tissue and cardboard and they're actually going to pick up all the boxes this week um, when, whenever we get around to unpacking them and uh, it, with the intention to reuse that and I think that that's kind of you know there's a bit of a conscious there a, a movement um, a sort of shift in, in attitudes towards that really so I think that that's that was a bit of an interesting observation for my, for my part um, and I think that's probably the same for day to day a little bit where people are perhaps using um, you know, uh, reusable coffee cups, a little bit more, a bit more conscious about that, water bottles, a little bit more refilling those, um, which obviously plays into your, your supermarket a bit, Tom. Yeah, yeah, exactly, absolutely. And I, I suppose, you know, is that, uh, is that a seismic change from just a few years ago, or is that something which is sort of slowly drip feeding into, into people's minds a bit? Um, well, I think, as we, we talked about earlier, about how um, Blue Planet 2 is, is mm. quite a big game changer and you know a lot of people have been making documentaries about the plastic issue well before that but they weren't quite making it into the sort of mainstream media um, and then I think because of the the David Attenborough personality and uh, the fact that it was BBC it just it just got to everybody and mm -hmm. so that change has started happening since I think it was December 2017 um, before that I mean we were doing research for the shop that we're with it, that we've got open now, and we were doing market research out on the street. We were questioning people whether they would use that kind of service. Would they come to our shop? And they all said, most people were saying it's, it's a great idea. It sounds really good, but I don't think people really would would make the effort. Um, but it just because of Blue Planet Two, we managed to raise quite a bit of money for our crowdfunding, which of course Deloitte helped um, with with sponsorship as well. Um, I, I think attitudes have completely changed because of that, and um, it's 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 gone exponentially um, since then. Yeah, I, I think it's it's that visual thing, isn't it? I think if people can see the impact, then it's a bit more powerful than you know hearing that. You know, I, I, I did a calculator and I, you know, I, I use over two and a half thousand bits of plastic over a year, but that's quite a big number. You know, these sort of uh, yeah, 300 million pieces of plastic every day are used uh, in the UK. Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's such a, a huge number, people can't really get that, but actually when they see the impact in the oceans or, or in nature and in, in the environment, then that's, that's a bit more powerful, I suppose. So. Yeah. Sorry, I was, I was just going to say, I, I sort of massively agree with that. Uh, you know, in the past year, the Blue Planet Effect has raised awareness around sustainability in general more than anything that has happened in, you know, the 10 years that I've been working in it. Mm. And I think it's very much that Sustainability is a, is a complex concept, and it's almost just a bit too much for for um, for people to grasp both the concept of it and the the implications of it. You know, if you start going, the world's going to end in <laughs> in 20 years, 30 years if we don't get our act together. People go, oh, that's terrible, and then they go, oh, but my daily life, what can I do? But the blue planet thing has really brought it home to people. It's, yeah, it's made it very visual when you see animals dying. On, you know, in on your screen in glorious Technicolor. Um, and it's also a simple thing to understand, you know, I've made a bit of plastic waste, it could well end up in the ocean and there is the damage that it's causing on my TV screen. So it's sort of helped, helped to simplify the whole subject, I think, uh, and make it a lot more relatable to people. Definitely, and I think you touched on 
people can actually do something tangible about it as well. Mm. So there's clear actions that you can take and you see, oh, I've, I've uh, produced one less piece of waste. Um, whereas in some of the other sustainability factors, you can't really see it as, as clearly. Yeah, I mean, a carbon footprint is a very conceptual thing. It's not something that you can visualise, whereas a, you know, a, a plastic bottle is something that you've just held in your hand and drunk your soft drink out of, and you can, you can really see. You know, one of, the, one of the most amazing and shocking things on, on that Blue Planet programme was where they opened up the stomachs of baby albatrosses, and they live on South Georgia, which is, you know, a thousand miles from the nearest sort of human, hab you know, permanent human habitation or settlement of any size, and uh, they were pulling things like toothpicks out of this baby al albatross that had died from having too much plastic in its stomach out of its stomach. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was incredible and shocking really, and really sort of brought it home to me. And I, I suppose, you know, Tom, you're, you've gone for this you know, zero plastic approach, and but for sort of the day to day, it's about maybe cutting down on, you know, not using straws or, or coffee cups and things like that. I mean, is, is there a sort of major culprit in, in the world of plastic? I, I know there's sort of different types of plastic, but I'm not, I have to say, I'm not very uh, educated about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as, as one of you touched on earlier, it's, it's, it's the convenience products with you, Ethan. Um, it's the, you know, you walk in, everyone's in a rush these days. Everyone's got to, um, you know, as you were saying, have their lunch at their desk. And it's about um, maybe being prepared and, mm -hmm. and preparing a lunch, maybe have some leftover dinner from the night before. Um, but also walking from place to place, you, you go into a corner shop, pick up a, a bottle of drink and a bag of crisps and a chocolate bar just to keep you going. There's so many people are doing that and it, you, may, you may even make every effort not to drop it, but it might get dropped anyway and then a lot of people do drop, drop things because they just don't care. Um, so it's those things that I think are the worst offenders. I mean, it's, it's not just those items though, it's, it's all, all types of food packaging. We saw on Blue Planet, I'm pretty sure as well, there was a, 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 some type of seabird that was dead and its stomach had a, um, some kind of food packaging like a rice packet or something in it, it was it stuck in my mind. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it is absolutely everything can, can escape the bin. I think, I think that's quite an interesting point you raise because we're told that, I mean, First of all, when you look at every, all the plastic you use, use in your life, it can be a bit o overwhelming to realise just how ubiquitous it is. I mean, it's in everything from your tea bags to your clothes and stuff, you know, like when you wash your clothes, that makes microplastics that go down the drain and get into the sea. Now, mm. what on earth are you supposed to do about that? So you could, you know, one way to tackle this is to, is to think, what are the easy things for me to tackle first? So mm. start, with, start with baby steps. Mm. Don't let it overwhelm you. Say... I'm going to stop drinking soft drinks and plastic bottles and carry water around with me instead. Um, I'll stop using cup, uh, takeaway coffee cups. I'll carry a keep cup around wherever I can. Um, stop using plastic carry bags, which is quite easy now, given the, the fact that uh, shops charge for them. So, you know, um, carry a reusable bag, but not a cotton one, by the way, because uh, cotton farming is terrible for the environment as well. Yeah. So <laughs> There's so many minefields, aren't yeah, there? There's so many mine, there's so many minefields, but... Yeah, start simple, work out four things that you can, four key plastic items that you can cut out. But then, just going back to your, your point um, about the, the uh, crisp packets and food wrappers and stuff that blow away into the sea, that's kind of an interesting one because they're the harder ones for you as a, as a person to cut out because all of your food is wrapped in something. All your food comes in a plastic packet with a bit of cling film on it and those are the types of things that I mean plastic film and plastic wrap and stuff like that can't generally be recycled oh, right. so there's not much value in it so it really is just a throwaway thing but equally it's kind of something that's har hardest to find alternatives for so well clean kilo. <laughs> yeah ex well exactly yeah. I mean like that's why we one of the th one of the items we sell now we probably started stocking it about last uh, back in maybe November so not straight away because we couldn't find it um, is crisps and we've found uh, a farmer in Staffordshire who grows the potatoes, he grows the rapeseed oil and he makes the crisps. Obviously it's a slightly, slightly bigger production than just him. Um, but they send their crisps in a reusable food grade bucket um, which comes to us, we get probably 10 at a time. And then we send all of those buckets back because it's only just down the road in Staffordshire mm. from, from Birmingham. Um, and actually my parents live in Litchfield so they drive it back as well, there's no added carbon handy. footprint. Uh, it's handy as well. <laughs> um, and, and they send them back again refilled with crisps and they go in a, an airtight jar in the, in the shop and people can, if they want their own container or they can use a paper bag that we've got as well. So we, we're trying to 
put in a lot of those convenience items as well, and so so that you don't have to completely cut them out of your life, you can still get them. Well, I think I think it's going to it is going to be sort of demand led, isn't it? A little bit. I know, I know just from the last few weeks doing this plastic free challenge, and uh, you know you're more attracted by coffee shops which give you a 20p discount for using a reusable cup, and mm. and and then you you sort of have this slightly discerning sort of approach to uh, you, you know, the brands you you associate with and and, and buy from, and you know and, and actually you're actually sort of almost uh, trying to look for the uh, environmentally friendly option sometimes. So I think hopefully that maybe that maybe will be sort of demand led and that that will make that change sort of happen more quickly. I suppose. So. Yeah, I was try trying to buy the most sustainable uh, sandwich bread last night actually, and I was looking at, all at the back of all of the cartons because first of all I was like, should I stop buying dairy because you know dairy is very bad for the environment, mm. and shall I shall I start start buying um, vegetable spread instead? Uh, but then all the vegetable spreads have palm oil in them. Yeah. It's a minefield. I mean, it, there's a lot of information out there and you've got to do, do the best you can to, to read all the product labelling, make your own mind up about <laughs> what's better and what's worse based on the information that you have. Uh, uh, and you touched on a point there where, you know, there's lots of um, eco issues at hand and not just about plastic, but it is the, the palm oil situation. It's, it's general sustainability, climate change and, and all the rest of it. So maybe it's, uh, I guess, yeah, the, again, the sort of baby steps will make makes you more aware of these these other issues at hand. Yeah, absolutely. I'll go back to what I say before, said before about the, the Blue Planet effect being the sort of biggest driver of of public awareness of sustainability that I've ever seen. Now it may just it may be mostly focused on waste and plastics in particular, but that's really positive if it if it drives awareness of of environmental issues in general. Um, I saw on the news this morning that a report's just been issued by the Institute of Public Policy Research, which is a, a think tank, and they're basically saying that politicians and, and policymakers are completely underestimating the problem of environmental degradation in the round. So not just plastic pollution, but climate change, loss of topsoils, ocean acidification, and all those kind of things. Biodiversity and that, as well. Yeah, biodiversity, and that, that we really are at a, a sort of tipping point now. And what we do in the next 10, 15 years is, is absolutely critical. So, yeah, so there is a cheery thought there. So, yeah, is, it's, so, so is it even worth having this conversation about, you know, well, not, not having a plastic coffee you, cup? You, you've, got to you've got to remain an optimist in this profession, haven't you? Otherwise, there's no point doing it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you could read the news and be very pessimistic, and you could read the science and be very pessimistic, but, uh, you know, the question we're asking is, can one small change save the world? Well, one small change can't save the world, but everybody's got to do something, and you've got you've all got to start somewhere. Mm. So well, if everyone makes one small change, then that's a lot of a lot of more change in in total. But um, but yeah, the, one of the issues with with cutting out plastic, and I'm really for it, of course. But if we change everything to glass, then you've got another issue in hand, which is that it weighs so much more, and you have got a bigger carbon footprint associated with that. And, you know, say for example, like we, we sell a few things now that come in glass rather than what used to be in a plastic packet. If, if everything changes to glass, we're going to have a, 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 an increase in, in carbon footprint. So it's, it really is difficult to, to make that balance, um, which is why we sort of push towards reuse rather than create a new thing and, and recycle, because recycling also requires a lot of energy and, and all the rest. So it's, it's y one thing that everyone has to do, if they can, is, is something called a life cycle assessment. And that is thinking about not just that moment while you use that product, but from cradle to grave, what energy is being used to transport it, to create it, to extract the minerals from the ground, from the use of it, and then to actually what happens after you've used it as well. And it's quite difficult to work all of those things out and, and know about it, especially for everybody. But um, that's quite an, an important thing to think about as well, mm. your life cycle assessment. And, and that sort of makes me not think, but makes me re-emphasise, I, I guess, that we need to rely on, on businesses and on government mm. to, to sort of help us with these choices and to make the right policy decisions, to make the right business, business decisions. And one thing that we can do as, as customers, consumers and clients is to is to sort of vocalise the fact that that's important to us, because um, governments react to voters and businesses react to their, you know, their their customers, their clients, their shareholders, and it's up to us as individuals. You know, we're all voters, we're all we're all customers of businesses. If we can vocalise the fact that this is really important to us and that we want those big organisations to to act in that way, they can use their expertise to take us through 
the you know the tough decisions and, and and help us with things technical things like what Tom's talking about life cycle assessment and all of the rest of the minefield around sustainability. So that's a really good way to, to sort of make an impact if you're slightly overwhelmed by the choices that you make in day to day life and what's the most sustainable. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And what tips would you give to some of our clients about helping their employees to be more sustainable or raising awareness for sustainability? Um, yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, this, this is what I do day to day and um, it's, it, it's often an issue finding something relatable, I would say. Um, in terms of a business like Deloitte, as an example, um, to people in their day-to-day -day jobs. So, I mean, we manage energy, we manage water, we manage waste. Um, and out of those, the only thing that people can really influence is waste because our buildings, they sort of run themselves. All of, you know, all of our lights are on, um, are on time switches. All of the machinery in the buildings are on, are on timers and controlled that way. So it's not like when you're at home when you can switch the light off. Um, in the office, you don't, you know, an individual person doesn't have that much connection to the energy that they use, or even to the water that they use, to be honest. Um, waste is, is somewhere where we can engage a lot more, and that's why the plastics thing is, is again, just to, to <laughs> repeat yourself again, it's why it's such a, been such a big thing in the past year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about finding something relatable to people, and, and waste is something that's very relatable. I, I, one of my things is always making sure that whenever I have a a six pack, which uh, may, may be more often than not, but you know, it's, it's making sure those sort of uh, plastic rings are, are cut, and so that you know, dolphins or anything can't get can't get trapped in them. But uh, yeah. I guess it's those sort of things, and uh, which which hopefully make a, some sort of difference. But, and Nick, you've uh, had a foot in both camps on the public sector and, and private sector, um, and we've been talking a lot about small changes which which may be able to help save the planet. But what are some of the big changes which businesses can make? Um, so I mean, I can give you uh, a sort of insight on what we're doing in Deloitte. Um, we started looking at plastic seri very seriously at the start of 2018. Again, the blue, blue Planet effect sort of catalyzed us as much as anybody else. And the first step we took was to look at all of the places that we use plastic and all of the types of plastic that we use. And uh, yeah, it was quite illuminating actually. I mean, our, one of the biggest users of plastic is obviously uh, catering waste. And we have a lot of, um, a lot of catering outlets on our site. Uh, equally, staff are bringing in uh, their lunches from outside, so that's that's a big source of plastic waste. But our single biggest plastic waste item was actually bin liners. Um, so you can see that there are you know there are different sources of waste and uh, obviously different requirements to uh, to deal with them. So I mean we we prioritised a plan basically based on the the size of uh, of, of the the usage of, of different plastic items, um, and uh, also sort of we prioritised quick wins. So things that we thought we could get rid of straight away. And give ourselves give ourselves a little bit of momentum. So initially, we got rid of straws. Um, straws is uh, one of the easiest things I think to replace, uh, and also it's a very visible thing. You know, um, Blue Planet showed the effect of straws on on uh, on sea life. So we got rid of straws. We got rid of all of our plastic cups in all of our offices, um, and anything that came in a sachet. So those were those were our quick wins, if you like. Um, since then, we've uh, given. Every member of staff in Deloitte a keep cup and a water bottle, so a reusable coffee cup uh, and, a, and a water bottle uh, for them to use in the office and uh, you know on the go at the same time. Um, and at the, uh, following on from that, we've started to get rid of paper cups. Um, so yeah, uh, and the next things we're looking at tackling are plastic cutlery. Um, we've already started to um, substitute that for wooden cutlery, which is obviously a, a, a better alternative, non-plastic. Um, and uh, then following on from that, we're going to look at food packaging more generally. I, I touched on, uh, on One New Street Square, uh, which is our new HQ building. I mean, as well as trying to reduce the amount of plastic we're using in that building as much as possible, um, that building was built to be very sustainable. So it's uh, been awarded BRIAM Excellent, BRIAM being a sustainable construction uh, standard. And it's also been awarded uh, Well Gold, which is uh, uh, a standard for, for the well-being of a building, the, the, the way it promotes occupant well-being through things like uh, the quality of the air, the quality of the water, the healthiness of the food offering within the building, provision of um, plants within the building and, and sort of natural scenes on the walls. Um, and we achieved that certification as well. And it's the, I think it's the largest uh, commercial fit-out that's achieved those two certifications to date. Uh, and one of the very first to combine them in the, in the same 
project. So that, so that's very positive as well. Yeah, that's great, and uh, yeah, the, I guess the hope is that other businesses, as they sort of you know build new offices and and, and develop in in London and other cities, you know, will try and meet those standards and, and replicate that. Well. Yeah, it's one area in which we've tried to be a leader and demonstrate what's possible. So I have prepared uh, a little environmental-based quiz. Um, so I've got a question for each of you, see how you do. So George, I'll start with you. Um, so the Pacific Ocean Garbage Patch, the notorious huge mound of garbage in the Pacific Ocean, which is made up of 250 billion pieces of plastic, is roughly about the same size as which country? A, Mongolia, B, France, or C, Argentina? Um, oh, uh, I'd go France, probably, because the other two are quite big, aren't they? Yeah, so it's actually twice the size of France, oh, right. and it's the same size as Mongolia. Yeah, That's quite frightening, isn't it? Absolutely huge, yeah. yeah. I heard that it was the size of Texas, so I assume Texas is twice the size of France. Yeah, I think it's twice <laughs> the size of Texas. Twice so the size Texas of Texas? I think Texas and France are ah, the same. Yeah, okay. that's the, uh, I had to Google. Just in the last hour, it's doubled, yeah, I think. It's doubled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still worrying, whichever yeah. way. I mean, they're trying to clean it up, I think. But. Yeah, actually, um, there's this project called the uh, the Ocean Cleanup, and it's uh, run by a, a Dutch entrepreneur. I don't know if you've heard about this, yeah. but so Deloitte Holland actually supported the Ocean Cleanup um, to start up as a business in much the same way as they support the Clean Kilo. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they, they did the same thing: business advice, business setup advice, consultancy, all that kind of thing to get get the Ocean Cleanup off the ground. Unfortunately, the um, they launched the actual Ocean Cleanup contraption in September, I think it was last year, and it broke when it was out at sea. So sadly, it hasn't made it to the Great Pacific gar garbage patch yet. But I mean, I think it's a brilliant thing that they're doing and hopefully they'll get it fixed very soon and be able to get it back out there. Okay, Nick, um, I'll go to you with this one because I think you touched on it earlier. So clothing accounts for what percentage of plastic in our ocean? 14%, 24% or 34%? Uh, I have no idea, but I'm going to say the, the highest number. It is. It's 34%. And as you said, microplastics when we wash our clothes. It's crazy, really, what, isn't it? Wash into the ocean. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay, and the final one, end on a positive note. So, Tom, one wind turbine can power A, 400 homes, B, 1,400 homes, or C, 4,000 homes? Um, I would say B, 1,400. Yeah, times. bang on. All right, oh, there we go. Two environmental experts. You, you guys oh, are true experts. <laughs> <laughs> Beat the quiz. <laughs> I've certainly learned a lot. So. <laughs> nice. Okay, so if, if one small change can't save the planet, but a lot of small changes can make a big difference to the planet, what is your one tip that you would offer to our listeners? Well, uh, I'm going to go slightly off topic because we've been talking a lot about plastic waste. My, my top tip is, uh, is not to do with plastic uh, or so much to do with waste, but it's to uh, cut down on your meat and dairy. So agriculture is one of the, uh, the biggest contributors to, uh, to climate change through the release of uh, CO2 and particularly methane from, uh, from cattle. Um, so yeah, cut down your meat, look at meat alternatives. Uh, you don't have to cut out meat altogether, but if you are going to have meat, uh, make it a treat and try and, uh, <laughs> try and buy good quality meat from a, from a local provider. It could be a whole other podcast right there, I think. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Make That's one for next treat. time. Yeah. <laughs> Make me to treat. <laughs> How about you, Tom? Um, for me, I'd say um, try and buy secondhand. Um, so the idea being reuse. And maybe the reuse thing is the, the tip, and buying secondhand is sort of one thing that you can do, like clothes secondhand, um, you know, just generally reusing things. That's um, quite a quite an important one because it just means that nothing new has to be created every time you buy something so yeah great two two great tips and two excellent experts here today thank you so much tom and nick for coming down thanks very much for having us. Thanks, thanks guys thanks for having us thanks for listening to this episode of the green room by deloitte next time tune in as we dive into our next big question will i ever feel good enough for my job this podcast is produced by our very own pod squad and hosted by george parrott lizzie elston and ethan worth Thanks to our creative studio for their technical support. Original music by Ali Barrett from our consulting team. Ooh.